Hello and welcome back to Shove Robots. Today we're going to be taking a look at SolidWorks Maker in episode 2 of my CAD Like an Engineer series. SolidWorks is a CAD package often used in industry and it's what I've used in my professional life for the past 5 or 6 years. SolidWorks Maker is the hobby version of that software. The sketching, modelling and assemblies are essentially the same, however it features some limitations you won't get on professional grade software. So let's talk about it to see if the software could be right for you. Then I'll pop together some parts for Project SVRN as a bit of a demo. And finally, we'll get on to some general CAD tips. Maker is the first fully paid CAD service we'll be looking at in this series. As of summer 2025, the cost is $48 a year with a sale on at $24 at the moment. They do, however, have a program for Maker Spaces, so if you're part of a Maker Space, you can snag this software for free. SolidWorks offer two Maker packages. SOLIDWORKS X designed for makers and 3D Experience SOLIDWORKS for makers. This is an important distinction and the one that we're looking at today is the 3D Experience SOLIDWORKS for makers. X design is a bunch of cloud-based apps whereas 3D Experience runs locally. To run this software you'll need a Windows PC with a minimum of 16 gigs of RAM and 32 gigs of RAM recommended, an x86 Intel or AMD CPU and it's recommended to use a graphics card from the supported list on their website. Now personally, I don't run a supported graphics card because I don't have an industrial card in my home PC and it works fine. However, your mileage with that may vary. Next up, let's talk about the limitations. The licenses for this piece of software are managed over the internet. So if you don't have an internet connection, unfortunately you won't be able to log in for the first time. Now SolidWorks do advertise that you can work in offline mode for up to 30 days after you've logged in However, in my experience, I've never actually been able to get this to work and it prompts me for a login every time. With the files you produce in SolidWorks Maker, you can save them either to the cloud or locally. What sets Maker apart from the professional suite is that the files are digitally watermarked. So unfortunately, with anything created in SolidWorks Maker, you won't be able to open it in the professional grade software. This is something worth knowing about if you intend to share files with manufacturers. This might come about if you've got a complicated part that you can't manufacture at home and you want to get a third party to make it for you to complete your project. It just means the manufacturer will have to work with step files rather than native SOLIDWORKS files. This version of SOLIDWORKS is designed for maker and DIY use, not commercial use. So if you sell products that you've designed with this software and you go over 2000 USD in profit, you will no longer be eligible to use the software. If you're planning to use this semi-commercially, it's worth looking into their entrepreneurship schemes and other license options. Okay, so with the boring stuff like licensing and hardware requirements out of the way, let's get stuck in and make some parts. Today, we're going to be producing a new wheel for Project SVRN. The F1 tires that I initially spec'd for this project have been a little bit tricky for people to get around the world, so we're gonna make one that works with Lego tires instead. If you've been enjoying the series so far, don't to subscribe, hit the like button and ring the bell so you don't miss the next episodes. So with SolidWorks open, we're presented with a menu that gives an option to make a part, an assembly or a drawing. For now, we want to make a part and before we can get stuck into our wheel, I need a reasonable model of the tyre. Now unfortunately, I wasn't able to find this online so I got out the vernier calipers and set about making my own model. To do this, first we select a sketch plane over here on the left hand side, right click and then hit new sketch. Sketch tools are located at the top of the page here, however like with on shape, the S key can be used to bring a small menu up next to the mouse to save you going to and from the toolbars. In this case we're going to select the line tool and then start sketching out the cross section of our tyre for a revolve feature. With the first line I right click and select the midpoint, then hold control and select the origin. This allows me to create a relationship between the two. You'll notice that the relationship manager pops up next to the mouse automatically. We can select relationships from here. In this case, the relationship will be coincident, so the midpoint will be fixed to the origin. The dimension tool can also be accessed via the S key. I'll use this to set the width of our line to the width of our tire as measured with the vernier calipers. From this point onwards, it's just a case of adding a few extra dimensions and making a few lines equal to each other or parallel to each other to define the shape. In SolidWorks, when a line is blue, it's underdefined, and when a line is black, it is fully defined. Or to put it in simple terms, the line can't move. It's very good practice when modeling in SolidWorks to try and make sure all of your sketches are fully defined. And if you're struggling to do this, grab a point that's blue and drag it and see which way it moves. That'll give you a good idea of what relationship or dimension needs to be added to constrain it. With that sketch complete, we head up to the Features menu at the top left, and then select Revolve. 
because we already have a dash centerline in our sketch, it will automatically pick up on that and then revolve the shape around it. With our basic revolve complete, I realised it would be more sensible to add the grooves in the original revolve feature than a secondary operation, so I went back in and edited the sketch and added the grooves. Next up, I added some fillets to the edges of the tyre. The fillet tool can be found in the features menu here. Fillets are added by selecting the edges that you want the fillet on and then setting the radius. Now, if I was doing this at work at this point, I'd stop modelling. That's because the features we have so far represent our tyre well enough to make a wheel. However, because I'm not and I don't want a pretty CAD model, I'm going to add the tyre tread pattern as well. I start out by creating a sketch on the top plane using the rectangle sketch tool. I make the centre of this sketch vertical with the origin and the top line tangential with the edge of the tyre. Next, I use some construction lines to create an angular offset between one tread block and another. I then use a three-point centre rectangle to make my second tread block, as this doesn't have the automatic horizontal and vertical relationships that are present with the regular rectangle tool. A few sketch relations and dimensions later, we have our sketch ready to go, and my plan here was to use the wrap tool to make a visual feature on the surface of the part. The wrap tool projects the sketch onto a surface. While this visually worked, I didn't like it as much as I thought, so I decided I'd change to an extrude cut. This gives me a chance to show off something quite cool, and it's changing a sketch plane. To do that, I deleted our wrap feature, and then right click on the sketch. The second option in that menu allows me to select a new sketch plane. In this case, I decided to reallocate our sketch to the edge of the tyre. Now I can extrude cut from this new location. All that's left is to make the tread go all the way around the tyre, and on the opposite side of the tyre. To do that, I use a circular pattern followed by a mirror. The circular pattern tool can be found here. Then we set the feature we'd like to pattern, what we'd like to pattern it around, and the number of instances. Now the mirror tool, which can be found here. But we must remember to mirror not only the pattern, but also the original feature, otherwise we'll have a small section missing. To use the mirror tool, we select the plane we'd like to use as the mirror, and then the features. And there we have it, the edge tread on both sides, all that's left now is to add a little bit of colour, and to do this we nip to the appearances menu in the right hand side here. It's a little coloured swirl, and then we can drag and drop any appearance onto a part or feature. Then, because we're going a bit OTT, I thought it'd be fun to add some text to the sidewall of our tyre. To do this, I create a sketch entity, select that sketch entity with the text tool, and then use the plethora of options within that tool to get the text positioned where I'd like. Finally, we just extrude boss that text and create a raised piece of text on the surface of our tyre. With the tyre complete, it's now time to cheat a little and reuse some of the work we've just done to create our wheel. To do this, we're going to click Save As and Open. It's important to make sure you have your previous part saved separately before doing this. Now we have our new part with a new name, and we're going to go back in and delete everything that isn't the first revolve. I'm then going to edit the sketch of the original revolve and sketch out a wheel hub inside it. One thing that eagle-eyed amongst you might notice as I do this is I'm designing the hub to interfere with the tyre. This is so the tyre press fits on nicely and is unlikely to come off during combat. One tool I'm using here that we haven't seen before is the three-point arc tool. This is incredibly useful for creating regular curves inside a sketch. From this point, it's just a case of adding relationships and dimensions until our sketch becomes fully defined. And there we have it, the startings of a basic wheel hub with help from the sketch we used to make our tyre. Most of the operations from this point forwards you'll have seen before, so I'm just gonna speed through them. So there we have it, one fancy looking wheel hub to go with our tyre. All that's left is to pop these into an assembly. So to make an assembly, we hit the new icon in the top left and then select assembly from the menu that appears. We should then be prompted with the begin assembly screen and this will show any other parts that we have open that we can take into the assembly. One thing that's important to note here is if we drag the part across, it will be floating, so we'll be able to move the part around, whereas if we select the part in the menu and hit the tick button, it will be fixed. Generally, I'll fix my first part in an assembly and then drag everything else across. 
However, because these parts share the same orientation and origin, because one was derived from the other, I can just hit fix on both. That way, they'll be automatically aligned and I don't need to add any mates. We'll come back to mates properly in a minute. However, for now, let's have a look at a useful tool. You may remember that I designed these parts to interfere with one another to help retain the tyre. Well, there's a tool in SolidWorks that can be used to check for interference, whether it's desired or not. This can be found in the Evaluate menu and the tool is called Interference Detection. Simply select the parts you want to check for interference, click Calculate, and then SolidWorks will visualise it for you. Here we can see, as intended, there's a slight interference between the inside of the tyre and the outside of the hub. So I think we're about ready to send that part for print, and while that's printing, that gives a little bit of time to look at assembly mates properly. I've quickly remade the same chassis and wheel we used in last episode's tutorial, and have imported them alongside the step file of the motor from last time, into this assembly. Currently the chassis is fixed and the motor and wheel hub are floating. To mate these parts we're going to go to the assembly menu up here and then click the mate button. Our basic mate types are listed on the left hand side and by selecting any two faces we can connect them with one of these types of mates. Usually SolidWorks will auto detect what type of mate you're trying to use. For example if you select two round surfaces it'll go for a concentric mate. Next up we select two flat surfaces and SolidWorks thinks this might be a coincident mate, however we want it to be parallel as there's a bit of clearance between the motor and the side of the chassis. Finally, to fully constrain our motor we select the motor faceplate and the inside of the chassis. And just like that the motor is fixed in place. Next we add a concentric mate between the wheel hub and the motor axle. Then to allow the wheel to still spin we make a coincident mate between the end of the motor shaft and the inside of the motor hub. We've already covered how to add colour to parts, so we'll gloss or matte over that. I'll skip ahead to adding material so we can get accurate weights. To do this, I right click on the part I want to add a material to, go down to the material option in the right click menu, and then click edit material. This brings up a library of materials to select from, and you can also make your own custom ones which I've done for TPU. In this case, I select an ABS polycarbonate blend. One small annoyance here is some materials have visual properties linked so you can end up undoing some appearances we added earlier. It's quite simple to just delete them, but it can be frustrating. Rather than adding the same part to an assembly over and over again, you can use mirrors and patterns to get the components where you need. To do this, we once again go to the assembly menu. This time we select mirror components. Like with mirroring features, we select the plane that we want to use as the mirror, and then select the components that we want to mirror. One cool thing is that you can mirror a mirror in a different direction. So we can derive the position of all of our motors and wheels from one. Before we tie up assemblies, there's one last thing to talk about, and that's component weights. If we select our motor, go to the evaluate toolbar, hit mass properties, notice that weight listed is not correct. To remedy this, we can hit the override mass button, and then put in the weight of the motor. Then, if we open this toolbar again, but with nothing selected, it will give us the weight of the assembly. This is a great tool when building for a weight class to try and figure out if our design will make weight. Now we've talked about how much it costs, what hardware you need to run it, and what it's like to design parts in, let's have some final thoughts. On the whole, I really like Maker and I think it's pretty good value for money for what you get. Now downloading and launching the software can be a little bit tricky due to the way that the connected system is set up, however once you've got the hang of it, it generally works quite well. Now would I recommend this software to an absolute beginner? Probably not, and that's purely because of the paid for model. If you just wanted to dip a toe into CAD packages, then probably try out some different ones first. However, if you do CAD regularly and you're starting to work with larger assemblies, then SolidWorks is excellent. It's also worth noting, if you're a design student, then SolidWorks can be a good choice too, as it's often used in industry and having this on your CV can be a big boon. Personally, SolidWorks is my daily driver. So Revron, Chevron, Elevron and Ferris have all been designed in it. It's a package that overall I'm very happy with. Ah, oh, would you look at that, I nearly forgot, the print's done. Let's get those new wheels fitted and see if they work. Perfect, so those work a treat. I've updated the Project SVR and Build Guide to include them, and a special thanks to Josh and Aidan, who pioneered using these tyres with their own wheel hub. That just leaves us with a little time for some tips, and this episode's ones will be quite quick. Firstly, use shortcuts. You've seen a lot in this video of me using the S key, bring up the context menu. If you have an operation that you do often, such as hiding and unhiding a part in assembly, look up the shortcut for that, in this case shift tab and tab. 
and even if there isn't, some cab packages allow you to map buttons to certain actions. A preference of mine is mapping the different view orientations to different keys. While each thing individually is a small time save, over the course of a design it can add up to quite a large amount of time. Tip 2 is watch your weights. In combat robotics, we're often designing to a weight limit, be it 150 grams, 1 pound, 1.5 kilos, 12 pounds, or 250 kgs. To get the most out of your cab package and save any nasty surprises, always try to keep your material properties up to date. Override the mass of any known components like I showed you earlier. It's also important to account for parts you might not model, for example the wiring. There's a little tip here, I always add the wiring weight into the weight of my ESCs. That way I don't get caught out when 5 grams magically appears on the scales that I didn't account for. Now there is a flip side to this coin, and that's 3D printing and infill. When using 3D printed parts, they often won't align with the weight of the CAD package. That's because the CAD package assumes them to be solid, and 3D prints often use infill. So that you're not leaving weight on the table that could be extra performance, you can use the weights generated by the slicer after you've designed the part to then override the mass properties of your part with and get more accurate weights. So thanks for watching, I hope this video has been useful. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like, and if you want to see more, please subscribe.